ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओम नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय श्रीमद भागवतम कैंटो नाइन Chapter 10, text 54, translation and commentary by His Divine Grace Srila A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Eka, Eka Patni, Patni Vrata, Vrata Dharaha, Dharaha Raja, Raja Rishi, Rishi Charitaha, Charitaha Shuchihi, Shuchihi Sva, Sva, Dharmam, Griha, Medhiyam, Shikshayan, Svayam, Acharat, Ekapatni Vratadharo, Rajarshi Charita Shuchihi, Svadharmam griha medhiyam Svadharmam griha medhiyam Shikshayan svayam acharat Shikshayan svayam acharat Eka patni vrata dharo Eka patni vrata dharo Rajarshi charita shuchihi Svadharmam griha medhiyam Shikshayan Svayam Acharat Eka Patni Vrata Dharo Raja Rishi Charita Shuchihi Svadharmam Griha Medhiyam Shikshayan Swayam Acharat Eka Patni Vrata Dharo Eka Patni Vrata Dharo Raja Shri Charita Suchi Swadharmam Griha Medhiyam Swadharmam Griha Medhiyam Shikshayan Swayam Acharat Eka Patni Vrata Dharo Raja Shri Charita Suchihi Svadharmam Griha Medhiyam Shikshayam Svayam Acharat Eka Patni Vrata Dharo Rajarshi Charita Suchihi Svadharmam Griha Medhiyam Shikshayam Svayam Acharat Devis Eka Patni Vrata Dharo Rajarshi Charita Suchihi Svadharmam Griha Medhiyam Shikshayam Svayam Acharat Eka Patni Vrata Dharaha Taking a vow not to accept a second wife or to have any connection with any other woman. Taking a vow not to accept a second wife or to have any connection with any other woman. Raja Rishi like a saintly king. Like a saintly king. Charitaha. Whose character. Shuchihi. Shuchihi. Pure. Pure. Swadharmam. One's own occupational duty. One's own occupational duty. 
griha medhiyam especially of persons situated in household life shikshayan teaching by personal behavior svayam personally acharat executed his duty Lord Ramachandra took a vow to accept only one wife and have no connection with any other women. He was a saintly king and everything in his character was good untinged by qualities like anger. He taught good behavior for everyone especially for householders in terms of varnashram dharma. Thus he taught the general public by his personal activities purport eka patni vrata accepting only one wife was the glorious example set by lord ramachandra one should not accept more than one wife in those days of course people did marry more than one wife even lord ramachandra's father accepted more wives than one but lord ramachandra as an ideal king accepted only one wife the mother sita When Mother Sita was kidnapped by Ravana and the Rakshasas, Lord Ramachandra, who was the supreme personality of Godhead, could have married hundreds and thousands of Sitas. But to teach us how faithful he was to his wife, he fought with Ravana and finally killed him. The Lord punished Ravana and rescued his wife to instruct men to have only one wife. Lord Ramachandra accepted only one wife and manifested sublime character thus setting an example for householders. A householder should live according to the ideal of Lord Ramachandra who showed how to be a perfect person. Being a householder or living with a wife and children is never condemned providing one lives according to the regulative principles of varnashram dharma. Those who live in accordance with these principles whether as householders brahmacharis or vana prastas are all equally important om gyana tinam hasya gyanam jana shalaka chakshun militam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha nama shrishtam manam api satchiputram atra swarupam Rupam tasya vijan guru purim bhatuin goshavatin Radha kundam giribramaha radhika madhavasam Prapta yasya pratita kripaya shri gurum tanda tosmi Andeham shri guru shri ataf parakalalam shri gurun vaishtapam stap shri rupam sahajatam Sahagana Raghuna Tam Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Sadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Titan Devam Sri Radha Krishna Padam Sahagana Lalita Sri Vishakam Vitam Stra Vishakam Vitam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Rama Lord Ram is glorified here for having only one wife means he's a lot better than Krishna who had 16,108 wives he wasn't content with one wife He already had one wife and he ran off here and there kidnapping different girls and different wives and then he married 16,100 queens who they're all unmanageable actually because they'd been kidnapped. So there you go. It's in the ninth canto. And the tenth canto is dedicated to Krishna. Not only that, Krishna 
When he got married, he was a little better, because before that, he was just running around with other people's wives. How many of them did he have? Well, it's billions. How can you have dance with more than a billion girls at one time? Krishna, has got any idea? You're a Brahmana, Brahma, Brahma Titi. What is that? Brahma Jana Titi Brahmana. So you're supposed to know what Krishna's Param Brahma. How can you dance with a billion girls at one time? I guess you have to be God to do that, right? You have to expand yourself into as many forms as there are gopis. Hmm. Well, Ram could have done that too, but he didn't. Krishna, as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we celebrate Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. Krishna is the original personality of Godhead. The Bhagavatam, composed by the sage Vyasa in his maturity, is in the first nine cantos leading up to the tenth canto, which in detail describes the pastimes of Krishna, including his dancing in the Rasa dance and marrying 16,108 queens. That was a very deep topic, isn't it? It seems to be contradictory that here Ram is being praised for having only one wife, and Krishna is praised for having 16,108 wives and many, many more girlfriends. And they're, they're both praised. Ram is praised for having only one wife. That's very good to have only one wife. And Krishna has so many wives. That's very good for him, not for you or me. If he does it, it's good. Not that we should do it. We praise him for doing it. So both things are there. It seems to be contradictory. And by mundane logic, it is contradictory. But it's all perfect. In everything is perfect in the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Krishna is not to be judged by mundane social standards. He showed that he is God in so many ways, beginning from killing uh, both, both Rama and Krishna, the first demon they killed were both women. So killing Putana. <clears throat> Maharaj Dasharath was very afraid that this young boy, Ram, still a teenager, he wouldn't be able to fight with these great demons. But Ram, by the blessings of Vishwamitra, and under his guidance, was able to do so. <clears throat> but Krishna, he didn't even wait till he was a teenager. By the time he was a teenager, he already had so many demons killed that he could hardly keep account of them. <clears throat> so they're both uh, killing demons. They're both the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But they came to fulfill different purposes, same basic purpose that they come from. Haritrāṇāya sādhūnāṁ vidāśāyata duśkṛtaṁ dharma saṃsthāpanārtāya Sambhavāmi yuge yuge In every age, Krishna says, I appear to save, lift up the saintly people and destroy the godless people, the rascals and to re-establish the principles of religion. Now, Ram does it in one way and Krishna does it in another way. Ram sets an example for the people in general and Krishna does also, but you have to know what's what. You have to know what, in Krishna's case, you have to know what to follow and what not to try to follow. Not to try to follow his example of dancing with those who appear to be others' wives, although actually they weren't. And marrying 16,108 queens, well, there's no limit on the number of wives, especially a Kshatriya can accept. But at the same time, not recommended. 
to have so many wives because they would be lonely, right? Because how many people can you have a personal relationship with? Krishna expanded himself into 16,108 forms and had 16,108 palaces and personally was with his queens every day. But an ordinary man can't do that. Or even a very great Kshatriya cannot do that. So although Kshatriya may mar marry more than one wife, here Ram is praised for having only one wife and taking a vow to do so. So why, why, why is that glorious? Because having many wives can also be good. That Srila Prabhupada explains that in society is often there's a disparity between the number of girls born and boys born and every girl must get married and usually women more than men and girls must get married but for men it's not compulsory they may lead a life of celibacy throughout their life and then what happens to the extra girls you can marry them to a banana tree or something but that's not very that's not very uh, pleasing to them that's done for getting rid of astrological mess-ups. <clears throat> but actually they want to live with a husband, so if a man, Srila Prabhupada explains this, so if a man, if he's capable of supporting, he may take more than one wife just to uh, be kind to those girls. And it may be that also he has a desire for more than one, one wife. Srila Prabhupada he said that when he married, um, he wasn't very satisfied with the wife that his father had arranged for. She was 11 years old at the time. And he was thinking of having another wife. And that was quite acceptable. And it, it was acceptable in Hindu society until recently, and still it's widely acceptable. Apparently not so much in North India. But still it's still you find people here and there, they have two wives and this and that. It's going on still. Mostly richer men who can afford who can afford to do that. And mostly I don't think they're thinking of doing it to protect different women. They're doing it because they have certain urges and when the wife gets pregnant and they have to go a long time without going outside dharma if you want to indulge sexually then it's a lot people criticize you if you have two wives they may criticize but then uh, they, if some man has adultery he's already married and he goes to some other woman and they, they think well you know, that's just normal isn't it just what can you expect? Men will be men. But taking a wife means to support, take responsibility for maintaining her and the children. So that's praised, not exactly praised, but it's allowed. And Ram, although he's praised for having only one wife, Ram himself wouldn't think, I'm better than my father, who had more than 300 wives. We hear about three of them, but there are a lot more, actually. And uh, Vasudev, the father of Krishna, also had many wives, married them all at once, and this was just considered normal, quite acceptable. <clears throat> so why, why is it so good that Ram only had one wife? What, what's so good about that? He's described here as Rajarshi. But Srila Prabhupada, in the word for word commentary, gives. I'm not sure Srila Prabhupada did this or whether Prajunda did it or whoever, but that's translated in the word for word rendition as like a saintly king. Because rishis and rajas, they're just about the opposite of each other in their lifestyle. 
Rishi lives in the forest and extreme. Well, for the sake of tapasya. And the king lives in the city, in a big palace, with lots of servants and and uh, queens and all opulence. Lots of servants. I, I saw there was a translation of preparations for the king's morning bath. And there are hundreds of herbs which have to be brought and powdered and this amount of this and this and that's all put in the water. And then they just pour it on him. That's all. It takes hours to prepare it. And then they just pour it on the king. And there is a, there's, he has all these maid servants, maid servants, and they're drying him off and this and that. Just for the king to take a bath it takes about maybe a hundred people just for him to take a bath in the morning. I, I reminded of Jai Lalita, she had one servant whose only job was to make horlicks. <laughs> when you've got lots of money, you just maintain people, you give them a little job. It's like, yeah. Give them a little job and then that's all they do. You, you maintain many people. Because after all in society, if it's well organized, which is one of the things that the kings do, they organize the society. What do people need? You need food to eat. And to produce enough food for the people, it's not, it doesn't require the whole of human society to work all the time. So what do you, you just need a few people to produce. Even if you're working with bulls and, and not tractors, it doesn't take so many people to produce enough grains for everyone to eat and then everyone in their backyard can grow a few vegetables and even if you don't grow them you just spit out a few tomato seeds of course tomatoes they didn't have in those days but you just throw out a few tomato seeds and then you find the tomato plants is growing anyway practically you don't have to do anything bananas they just they're like if it wasn't a good fruit to eat you think it's like a weed it just grows here and there just by itself everywhere so uh Growing food, it's, it's not such a problem. Of course, you need rain. For that, you have to do yagya. For that, you need brahmanas. And then people say, well, what's the use of brahmanas? Well, they're doing all these mantras. What do you need that? Well, they need that for the rain to come, at least for the rain to come. Uh, but the, in human society, the, there are occupations which don't, they're non-productive. Maybe most of humans are non-productive, uh, entertainers, teachers, you could say they don't actually produce anything, they, they prepare people, they don't actually produce our immediate needs. Uh, administrators, I mean, well that's required, isn't it, administrate, but they're not productive. So they're, what's required in human society, the minimum subsistence, you need food, you need some kind of social system to organize, but then you don't need entertainers, you don't need religious priests, I'm just talking about the, the material subsistence. And there are many people who, they, they have to be engaged, productively engaged. So the kings, that's, that's one thing they do. And I'm saying about their bath, but even before they get up, there, there are people who, the, the suitors, and the, the first thing they do is they wake up the king, the musicians, and they praise their glories, and that's how they wake up. And that's what they do. You find in uh, Tamil Nadu up to the present time, there are people, all they do is bang a drum. That's what they do. They go to weddings and funerals, and you know when someone's died because the drum is drilling at a certain beat, and uh, that's what they do. They go around. They're not producing anything, but they have a function in society, and people pay them and this and that. I don't know if they'll do it in the next generation. They may just put a, a, a soundtrack on, like they used to have. Yeah. And anyway, the kids will go to school and they'll, they'll learn how to get money from the government. That's all you have to learn, right? You don't have to learn anything else. 
and learn how to get a government job, and that's you know, you know uh, maybe sign your name or something. That's all. So they go to school, and then they become useless, or they might become useful also in some way or other. Run off to Bangalore, get a job in an IT company, something like that. <coughs> So the, the, the king organizes society in a way that everyone is engaged and everyone is uh, happy, everyone has their position, and just to serve him, the thousands of servants, you see that in, in the dowries which are mentioned in the Bhagavatam, there's thousands of maid servants, you think, what do they do? What do you do with thousands of maid servants? Nowadays, you don't, you don't even need a maid servant. You just go, just go outside and walk outside. You go to the cafe and you you, you buy some ready-made food and you eat it standing up, right? In Bangalore, you see everywhere they do that. And then you then you jump on your motorbike and go off somewhere. And what do you you know? But traditionally, to prepare a meal it requires so many people and yeah. Uh, So many, especially for the king, and in the kings they have to entertain very lavishly, and, and they have to hold public yagyas. It's a big social position. So the king, he's the antithesis of a rishi who lives in the forest with nothing. He may have a wife. He might even have two wives. Sometimes, usually not. We know Yagya Valkya had two wives, whose names were... Anyone? You should know one from Srila Prabhupada's commentary on Bhagavad Gita. He mentioned... Gargi. Remember that? And the other one is Maitreyi. Gargi was spiritually interested and Maitreyi wasn't. So sometimes the, the rishis, they have more than one wife. Generally just one wife because they only take a wife for the sake of producing children. That's all. It's just dharma. That's all. Putraite kriyate bharya. That's all. That's not. The first son is called a dharma putra and after that karma putra. The first one is produced for dharma and then after that it's out of desire. Of course, the desire may not be completely uh, divorced from dharma also. And it might not be a bad idea to have more than one son, because in this modern age, especially sons, uh, they, they may die early. That wasn't expected previously. It's a, it's a, the king is supposed to be at fault if the son dies before the father. It's the king's fault. Really? How is the king to play? It means he's not execute, he's not pious, and such such untoward things can happen in the state. So the rishis they they have a wife for the sake of producing children. We we learn of the Balakilyas, sixty thousand, and uh, they were great rishis, and they were brahmacharis, naishtik brahmacharis, but they were shown the vision that you'll have to suffer in hell for not producing children because they were brahmacharis. They didn't marry all your brahmacharis. Did you hear that? <laughs> What's the answer to that one? What are you going to say? Come on all your bhakti shastra. <laughs> What's the answer? Devashi Bhutaktanam Pitri Nam Nakinkaro Nayamani Charajan Sarvatmana Yah Sharanam Charam Sharanam Katoma Kundam Hari Hritra Kartam. So being a Brahmachari isn't an excuse just to avoid the responsibility of getting married. It's, uh, one has to surrender fully to Mukunda. Then you're free of that debt. Otherwise we have debts. And getting married, one takes a wife to produce sons, and 
in this way one repays debts to the forefathers who took the trouble of producing you and your forefathers. So it's a very complex culture and it's all interlinked and the rishis and the rajas, even though they had very different roles, the rishis living in the forest with nothing, maybe they make a little hut out of twigs or they live in a cave that Shukadev Puttaswami preferred. The cave, right? What is the... You don't need a pillow, you've got your hands, and you, you don't need a drinking bowl. I think you might carry at least a drinking bowl, but you've got your hands, you can, you can take water with that. And you, can, you don't need a bed, you can just lie down on the floor, and you don't need a house, there are caves in the mountains. You don't need anything, Shukadev said. So the rishis, they live a very renounced life, even living with their wives who must be on the same level of renunciation. And the kings are supposed to live a very opulent life. At the present time in the world, we have the influence of Marxist philosophy, which has reached to the depths of woke ideas that anyone who's under Anyone who's in a lower position socially, they have to rise up and drag the people above them down. But that kind of envy, theoretically or ideally, is not there in Vedic culture or in any God-centered culture. It's understood. The king is a representative of God. Where is that stated in Bhagavad Gita? Quick, 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 quick. Tenth chapter. Naranam Nagarvanam. Didn't get it yet. Naranam Cha Naradhipam. I am the king among men. So that's not they're not envied for that. Rather they are respected and loved ideally for that. Understanding that they must have been very pious in a previous life, and the situation I'm in is because of what I did in a previous life. We're all on the wheel of time, the wheel of reactions. Uh, Sangsa chakra. The king, they take blessings from the rishis, and the rishis, they perform austerities in the forest not only for their own liberation, but for the benefit of the whole world. That everyone may be benefited by then doing austerities. And then everyone, they, they want to share their punya. And sometimes they may come to the uh, palace of a big king. Or they may come, especially when the king is holding a big public sacrifice and they'll come and take charity and the king will give them gold and so many things to give them. They don't even want it. They just take it to benefit the king and benefit the whole kingdom. Just like with Maharaj Maruta that's described. He gave all coals mounted, huge utensils and so many things and gold to the Brahmanas. For at the, they all came to perform the ceremony. And then when he was over, thought, what are we going to do with all this? It's too much trouble, too much hassle to carry it back. So they just left it there. He says, oh, it's gold, it's just too much hassle. And then eventually, Dhananda, Arjuna came and collected it all for performing another sacrifice. Otherwise the Brahmanas, they said, okay, give him 10,000 tons of gold, okay, thanks very much. And you will pretend you said to the brother, you take the whole earth. Okay, we'll accept it. Now you take it back. <laughs> we don't want it. You, you can have it. We'll just live in the jungle and we'll do our austerities and you'll be the king. That's all. So they interlink, but they're very different roles, but all for the same purpose. Then how do we get a Rajarshi? It's a Raja's opulent, powerful, engaging politics engaged in enjoying life and the rishis are just renounced even 
They live with their wives, but they're very self-controlled. It's not that they're lusting after their wives. They live as, for the sake of dharma, they live with their wives. And the kings also, for the sake of dharma, live with their wives. And Ram was exemplary in that regard. He lived with his wife for the sake of dharma. He thought, well, I can, I can execute dharma with one wife, then why do I need more than another? And he's praised for that because he's a Rajarshi. Even though he can enjoy everything, he is not in the mood of enjoyment. He will accept the king's throne with all the luxury. Dasharat says, tomorrow you'll be, you'll be crowned. As your order. Then he gets the message the next morning, tomorrow you have to go to the forest. As your order. He was neither attached to getting a right kingdom, nor was he attached to uh, to not doing nor was he upset when he was told that you have to go to the forest. Now normally to be sent to the forest, that's a terrible punishment. You have to do something really, really wrong to be banished to the forest. But there was no reason, no reason given. Just Kai Kai said, I want him sent. She didn't, she didn't even say, he did this wrong and that wrong. She didn't even feel there was a need to. Just go, that's all. I said. I... But Ram, he didn't question. Everyone else questioned it. Even Dasharath himself, too late, questioned it. He said, why don't you just kill me and uh, take over the kingdom? Ram said, no, I don't. I'm not going to break my dharma, I'm not going to break your dharma either. You also, you also uh, gave your word. So he was a Raja and a Rishi, literally. He wasn't Rajarshi in the sense of being like a rishi, living in the city, but with a, with a detached attitude. He went to the forest. And it was unusual to see, because he looked like a rishi in many ways. Kai Kai very kindly arranged herself personally for the, uh, the clothing made of tree bark. Being a little sarcastic. Huh? So they looked like a rishi, he and Lakshman, but they had bows and arrows. And when the when their enemies in the forest, the Rakshasas, saw them, they'd say, "What is this? Some cheaters? What? What is this? You're like a rishi, but you've got bows and arrows. This is contradictory." And Ram told them, "The bows and arrows are for you." <laughs> Because as a king, it's my duty to protect the rishis in the forest from people like you. Goodbye. So goodbye means he sends them off. So Ram, he was living like a rishi on the, literally as a, like a rishi on the order of Kaikei. But at the same time, he didn't give up his duty of being a king and protecting the actual rishis in the forest. Now, here in the purport, no, in the uh, verse translation, Srila Prabhupada, as he often does, intertwines some purport with the translation. He adds something which is not directly in the Sanskrit. He, Srila Prabhupada wrote that everything is in his character was good, untinged by qualities like anger. Now, I'm not a Sanskrit expert, but I'm pretty sure that there's nothing directly in the Sanskrit there which says, untinged by qualities like anger. But it's bhavarta, that is the term used for the Bhagavatam commentaries. It means it gives, gives the meaning. It's a, a rendered, it's explained what's meant there. 
And things were called is like anger, but Ram was angry, right? You got that Srila Prabhupada explained that that uh, Arj Arjuna wanted to be a peaceful man and not fight. And Krishna incited him to anger because without being angry you can't fight. Srila Prabhupada explained that. So in the same way Ram was fighting in the forest. Well, in the forest, first of all, his first fight was in the forest with uh, Vishwamitra. And then later on, during his banishment, he met so many, so many Rakshasas, and especially this uh, Kala and Dushan and all the huge army of Rakshasas. He, he single-handedly finished them off. And Lakshman said, leave it to me. He said, Ram said, no, I'll do it. <laughs> one, one is enough. <laughs> didn't, even, didn't even need both of them. Lakshman thinking, oh, great. No. And Ram said, you just go look after Caesar. He's, he's the elder brother, so the fun, he gets all the fun. Right? <laughs> kill. So he had to be angry, right, to kill them all. He killed them all. And uh, here, Sri Prabhupada is free from qualities like anger. You're going to teach them in the Bhakti Shastra course. How do you explain that? Ram is free from qualities like anger, but he's killing people left, right, and center. Ram's famous for killing Radha, right? And Hanuman is the famous as the great devotee of Lord Rama, who well, not only Hanuman, he burned Lanka and oh, acts of extreme violence and arsonist. He, no one asked him to come. He came in, sneaked in, and set the whole place on fire. Now I'm talking like Ravana, maybe. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we did that, if we went to a town and set it on fire, that would be, uh, who does that? It's, it's a great, it's very wrong, isn't it? That's done with weapons. They, they bomb places and set it on fire. They have this uh, incendiary missiles and all this. But there, certainly anger is there. But the anger of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is not the anger that Krishna talks about when he warns against it. Again and again in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna warns against anger. Uh, from calm comes crowd, from, from lust comes anger, from anger comes delusion, three gates to hell, one of them is anger. That's, this anger is the the anger that arises in the heart when one is defiant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and wants to enjoy this material world separate from Him. <clears throat> but anger can be a very good quality. For a king, it's required for him to be angry. Yudhe chapya palayanam. One of the qualities of a king mentioned by Lord Krishna in Bhagavad Gita, he doesn't flee in battle. He stands and fights. And it's not an Olympic Games archery contest. It's you you die or I die. That's the that's how it is. So it's not just standing there with a with a you got a moving target who's trying to kill you and you're trying to kill them. Well that's if you're fighting on a chariot. And you've got to protect your chariot driver and it, it's it's requires a lot of skill and why would you do that? You could just surrender the whole kingdom and say, hey, take it. I don't, just take the kingdom, that's all. I don't want to fight. But the Kshatriya, then he's not a Kshatriya. He's supposed to protect the citizens from tyrants. He's supposed to be a good king himself. 
uh, tyrant, they become very powerful. That's what happened. The whole of India was invaded again and again and again by belligerent kings coming in from the west. They didn't invade for the sake of Dharma. Superficially, they may have said it's for the sake of Islam, but they could have they could have gone into the, they, they came from where, Central Asia? Why didn't they turn toward India? Why didn't they go to the Sahara Desert? Right? And then they could have gone on into Africa. Why did they come to India? It wasn't just for the sake of, of their Islam. They, they wanted the, the wealth, and the women, and the land, and, the, the, and uh, the, that kind of uh, tyranny. They, they were tyrannically, they overruled India for hundreds of years. Of course, some people want to rewrite the history and say, no, actually they were very good. But uh, the Kshatriyas, they're supposed to protect against them. And what happened? Why, why, how were they overcome? That's a big history. One, they say because the Rajputan kings were, the Rajputs were fighting among themselves. They'd come together to fight against the invading Mughals, but then in the meantime, they'd fight among themselves. And they said the Mughals had better, they had horses and more advanced, this or that. One reason we know in South India is that the, the, uh, the uh, what's that, the Vijayan, What's that kingdom? That is now in Hungary. Vijayanagara. Hmm? Krishna Krishna Devara, yeah. He had one major reason he lost is because he had two battalions of Muslims, headed by Muslims, who he had maintained all his life. And when the Muslims attacked from the north, they just went his two battalions went and joined the other side. So one reason they, they, they were overcome is because the Kshatriyas were used to fighting according to Dharma, but then the Muslims, they didn't follow that. They'd come and attack in the night and set the tents on fire and all things like that. And only they were able to be pushed back a bit when Shivaji, who wasn't a Kshatriya by birth, he used dirty tactics too. And then only he was able to push back. So it's a long history and it's difficult to sort out because history is beset with uh, lies. Everyone wants to make them their own people look the best. As Winston Churchill said, history will treat me kindly because I intend to write it. But now it's come out that Actually, I, I just say, I was just reading a Vyasa uh, Puja offering from Guru Dasra, who you remember was one of the big early pioneers of the Krishna conscious movement. And then he, in his one Vyasa Puja offering this year, he wrote that, he wrote something which I'd never heard of before, that he went, he arranged a visit of Srila Prabhupada with he said the abbot at Westminster Abbey, which means a big figure in the Church of England, not as big as the uh, Canterbury, the Archbishop of Canterbury, big, the big figure in the Church of England. And he said Prabhupada went there and Prabhupada asked for a glass of water and the abbot personally brought it. And then they, both of them just sat there and they didn't say anything. And they were just... And, but he said that that was arranged by a Baron Sorensen. And I never heard it was Baron Sorensen. Sounds like a Scandinavian name, not an English name. So I looked it up and in Wikipedia, where else? And yeah, he was actually, his father was Danish and uh, he, was, he was a big man. Gurudas and Shamasunda, they had this knack of meeting big people. Shamasunda mostly from the hippie side and Gurudas from the, the, what you could call the secular or official side. He met Kenneth Keating, the US ambassador to India and arranged a meeting with Srila Prabhupada. 
Kenneth Keating was very interested and very appreciative. So, uh, so this Baron Sansa, and I looked it up, when he went with Gurudas to meet this abbot, he must, it must have been a year or so before he died. He was already old, he's about 80 years old. But the point I'm coming to was that he was a member of parliament in the 1930s. And he openly stood against the British Empire in India. He openly said in Parliament that we're complaining about what Hitler's doing to the Jews, but what we're doing in India is no better. And I'd never heard of anyone in England and I'm having such a view. It's edited out of history. You don't know about it. I didn't know. I, I, I learned history at school, but they didn't teach us that. You just get the idea that Winston Churchill's very great and we defeated the Nazis and all this kind of thing. But they don't tell you there was a lot of, there was opposition within England to the British Empire and, and ruling over India and the kind of atrocities that, that Winston Churchill, he ordered, there was opposition to that, but we don't hear about that. So what was the point? That, that history gets on, it's very difficult to sort it out. To understand it, but we can un we can understand this history, the history of Lord Rama. We can understand from Shastra. This is written by Valmiki, written by Vyasadeva. They're trustworthy, and they can also see what's going on. Trikala Darshi. They can see in future, in the past. They know what's going on. Another thought I had when I was looking up Sorensen, Baron Sorensen in the Wikipedia, I came across something, what was it? Ethelred the Unready, from, I'd never heard, he was a king of England before William the Conqueror. And if you're not born in England, you've probably never heard of William the Conqueror, and you didn't lose anything for that. But it's, he is a big figure in English history. The last person ever to invade Britain was William the Conqueror in 1066. They'll have a big celebration, I guess, in 2066. If Britain hasn't become part of the worldwide caliphate before that, which is quite possible. So, just reading about Ethelred the Unready, it seems it's a thousand years ago, and the way people were living, it sounds like a fairy story or something. You can hardly imagine that it's real, that people were living like that, and it's such a long time ago, and you can almost imagine that dragons are going to come. Or it, it, the, the, the reality mixes with the... with the mythology, and that's very much true in that, now I'm getting into English folklore, the Arthur, King Arthur and the Round, what's it, and the Round Table and Camelot and Lancelot and Lady, whatever her name is, Sunday B U G. it's all part of the English history, but it's all mixed up with, with, it seems to be mythology, there's a sword which is in a, in a rock, Excalibur, and whoever can draw that sword out of the, the stone, it's embedded in the stone, will be the king, and the, the young boy Arthur comes and brings it out. You've heard of this? Really? How did you hear about that? Way over in Croatia. You never know. The English are very good at propaganda. On the BBC, do you ever go to the BBC News? It says, News you can trust. <laughs> news you can trust to be bogus. <laughs> It's the, the British Propaganda Division. So, so it's, it's like it mixes with some kind of mythology, but we don't read Ram Lila like that, do we? And Ram Lila really is mixed up with what you might call mythology. And that's what the, in that book that Satcher has made years ago, at the Clifford Hospital or something, some scholar wrote, it's like a Walt Disney movie, and there are talking animals and hobgoblins, but we don't take it like that. This is this is real. This is a fact. Ram is a fact. We're learning from the character of Ram. This is reality. 
That's what happens with these scholars. They don't believe all this. I, as, as a child, I used to read books of world folklore, and I used to, all over the world, there's things like dragons and talking snakes and wizards and all that, and I thought, it's probably true. Otherwise, how do they have it all over the world? And I think many people thought that was true. That's, uh, otherwise, how could they have movies like uh, what is it? Harry Potter and this and that? Because people, at least tentatively, they can consider it true. Then we get into another whole subject of how, yeah, the whole, the whole worldview at the present time is this, we're just supposed to, believe, we only believe what we can see, and then the, there's, there's all this mythology, we don't believe in this, and God, we don't believe in that. And even, even uh, at the present time, for instance, coronavirus is going on, and we all say, yeah, it's all caused by a virus, it's caused by a germ. Well, not so long ago, at least in India, people would say, well, the gods are unhappy, which is a fact. There's a, there's a deeper reason also. And for uh, smallpox, there was the, the, the goddess that, uh, what's her name, Shitala, Shitala worshipped for smallpox. So what's right? What's the name of Jenner or something? Was an English scientist he discovered. People looking after cows don't get smallpox. They get cowpox. So he, he got cowpox and started. I don't know if they injected it first of all. And that, that, by vaccination, they stopped smallpox. There you go. That's what I told you last time. I said everyone should get vaccinated, right? <laughs> Whoops, I'm not very good on a charity. I didn't. I didn't get vaccinated. Hey, you want to hear some more pajama? Interesting pajama. That uh, years ago in Bangkok, I, in the middle of the night, I got terrible stomach pain. It must be gastroenteritis. So I woke up, my god brother, uh, Chaitanya Jeevan, was there. He's from America. Quiet, gentle, but he can kill you just like that, very strong, real Kshatriya type. But he wouldn't kill you because he's self-controlled. Very nice to him. So I said, yeah, you've got to take me to the hospital. So he took me to the hospital in the middle of the night. And then I was lying down. And they pulled up and they looked and he, and he looked here. And he said, Chaitanya he said, you know why they're looking? He said, they're looking for needle scars to see if I'm a heroin addict. It's the first thing they look for. The state of society. People are suffering. We're sitting here nicely talking about Lord Ram and being very happy. And people are suffering, suffering, suffering. We used to see in the West how people are suffering from drugs. And it's right here now in India. Same thing, kids on drugs, and then they go crazy for money, and they'll kill their own parents, possibly. Anything they'll do. Very, very bad situation. So you better build your temple and then you just preach, preach. And then we have to establish Varnasha and Dharma. So many things to do. So many things. There'll be so much opposition. People say, no, no such person, no such person is not wrong. You say Ram is good, Ram is very bad. And people will say that also, right? He uh, ditched his wife. She didn't do anything wrong. The, the, the same people, if Ram had not banished her, they would blame him for not banishing her. He banished her and they blame him. Very difficult people, very hard. It's a very tough situation in India also. It's like half the population is, at least in the, in the village areas, they're all drunk all the time. That means the men, mostly. So far, the women are doing all the work. See, there's a huge factory coming up in Hosur, 10,000, all women. All women. I guess they know the men, they'll get drunk, they'll go in unions to employ the women, they're better. 
That's the way it is. The world is such a mess. There's a lot of work to do. Anyway, you know very well there's a lot of work to do, right? Because you're busy building your temple. I'm, up, I'm holding you up here, waffling away. You should get out and do that. And then you have your Bhakti Shastra class going on. So study. Understand all these things. And then preach. Live an ideal life. Following the example of Lord Ram. There's something else I wanted to say about Ram setting an ideal example. But anyway, I'll finish that. Maybe tomorrow we have tomorrow description of Mother Sita. Hare Krishna, Hare Rama, all glories to his divine grace in the world. Vancha Kalpata Rupyastra Kiparasimha Vedanta. Patita Anam Parvade Pyo Vaishnavi Pyo Namo Namaha Dante Nithaya Chanakam Pradeyone Bhakta Kripla Chaka Kushatame Tanaham Ravim He Sadhava Sakla Evanta Adura Garanga Chandra Charade Kurita Anuradaha Paribhata Tu Jano Yata Tata Vala Namukha Namo Namayam Vichara Namaha Hari Vasana